Welcome to today's episode of Focus On. I'm Nastasia Aransa. The total investable wealth currently held on the African continent amounts to $2.5 trillion and its millionaire population is set to rise by 65% over the next 10 years. That's according to the 2024 Africa Wealth Report. Today we're looking at the possible ramifications of the U.S. election on African markets and economies and what you can do to protect your wealth. For more on this, I'm joined by Adam Fired, who is the founder of Adam Fired Brokers. Adam, thank you so much for your time. Let's start off with the U.S. elections. It was the talking point for pretty much most of the week and probably weeks in the lead up to that election date. Take me through your reaction when it comes to that outcome and the impact it had on the markets. Well, when it comes to the markets, the markets have had a very good reaction just as they did last time and the time before. The markets do like the certainty that this election has bought. Markets do tend to do well in the US after an election. But what was very interesting is a lot of bank stocks and other stocks in highly regulated areas skyrocketed after Trump's victory because people might disagree with many aspects of his agenda. But I think the deregulation agenda is certainly something that could be very good for uh, US markets or certainly certain sectors like the financial sector. What is a bit more uncertain, of course, is his plans for tariffs, because if Trump does bring in these tariffs or partially brings in these tariffs, that could actually increase inflation, which therefore means interest rates won't go down as much as expected. And also many emerging markets, whether it's in Asia or Africa or beyond, are highly dependent on international trade. So when it comes to these kind of tariffs, um, a lot of emerging markets could be a bit vulnerable to them. So that's going to be the big question as well going forward in the next year or two. So let's build on some of those themes that you just spoke about, especially as it relates to the banks. I mean, the need for financial deregulation in the US and in order for it to stimulate growth, are there risks? How are you looking at that conversation, especially given the, the rally that we saw uh, with the banks? Well, there's always risks, but often it's overplayed because what you've got to remember is if you just look in the last, say, five or 10 years, how many regulations have been revoked in the US or any country versus new regulations, uh, you can see a huge mismatch. There's thousands of new regulations and very few are revoked. And it's pretty fair to say that the SEC and pretty much all these major regulatory bodies are staffed to the hilt. Uh, but they were staffed to the hilt during 2008, and that didn't stop the financial crisis happening. And um, I think there's always risks of anything. But what could be interesting is to see if some of these regulations are loosened, what effect it might have on the banks and other financial sectors going forward. Uh, I think also what's quite interesting, of course, is that when Elon Musk came into Twitter, he got rid of 90% of staff and people said that the website would be down and it would be chaos. And of course, that didn't happen. And that resulted in many people thinking that Musk should, uh, you know, be part of the Trump administration's kind of cost cutting um, agenda in certain agencies. Obviously, we'll have to wait and see if it's a success or not. But I highly suspect that uh, a lot of these agencies could be cut dramatically and actually the safety of the consumer wouldn't actually be affected at all. When you speak of emerging markets, uh, one can't help but uh, bring up the topic of China. Does the election outcome and the market reaction to that sort of force the hand of Beijing to unleash full quantitative easing? Yeah, quite possibly, because the economy is already weak in China, probably more than the official stats actually show. And many economists have also brought up that point. And then the last thing they need is also a... Um, you know, a, a trade war, or partial trade war with the US. So it looks like China might be forced to stimulate a little bit more because the external environment is actually very weak for them right now. With that being said, though, you never know what could happen. It could just be the case that the Chinese have a deal with the Americans where they say, well, look, we'll build factories in the US to get rid of these tariffs. And there's some kind of negotiated solution. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. But obviously, in general, this isn't good news for China, what's happening. But having said that, it's now a bipartisan consensus pretty much in the US where the US has become more protectionist and that would have continued under Harris. Of course, Trump's uh, tariffs are much more uh, extreme if he brings them in. And that would definitely be a major risk for China. 
But as I think we discussed last time when I was on this program, at the end of the day, the economy and the stock market aren't always linked. So actually, if China's economy is weak, it could be good for their stock market potentially because they might have to do quantitative easing and stimulation of the economy uh, and so on and so forth, lower interest rates. And that could actually be good for asset prices. So we've seen that recently in the last six months, the Hong Kong stock market has been pretty much the best performing developed stock market in the world, even though the economy is pretty weak. Over the past couple of days since we've gotten that election result, uh, what are some of your clients asking you? Well, I mean, some of the clients, of course, are a little bit concerned whenever there's any change and people in general are easily concerned by these things. I think people are less concerned, though, compared to eight years ago, because eight years ago, when Trump came into power, a lot of people were panicking about what the ramifications of that could be. But of course, the ramifications weren't negative on the stock market. At the end of the day, stock markets and assets in general tend to go in a fairly favorable direction long term, no matter who's the president. It went up during Biden's time. Trump's time, Bill Clinton's time, and so on, Obama's time. So I think this time, people are less worried. Having said that, I think they are worried about emerging markets, as you said, China as well, and also the sectors as well. So the perception very much amongst many people, probably quite rightly, is the financial sector, the energy sector. Also, in addition to that, uh, defense stocks could actually be something that could actually uh, be a good play here. So I think people aren't pressing the panic button, so to speak, but they are definitely curious about what kind of sectors and countries could be winners and losers from this. The one thing I found quite interesting is that we're starting to see a lot of these uh, Trump trades uh, beginning to unwind uh, a touch. I mean, if you look at them in a couple of places, notably the U.S. dollar has come off a bit, and especially post the Fed and the comments that came out of that. I mean, what was, uh, I mean, if you had to think, um, what was the most unusual aspects or perhaps even aspects around the Trump trade that didn't make sense to you? One thing that was interesting was small cap U.S. companies really skyrocketed after what happened with, with the election. And I can understand the trade from the point of view that ultimately, uh, if the U.S. is going to become a bit more protectionist, which has been the general trend now for 10 or 20 years, arguably, that's going to be good for the domestic economy, potentially in the U.S., and less good for exporters. But ultimately, though, by the same token, if you've got a situation where the U.S. is actually... Um, you know, putting in tariffs and other measures, some actual small companies might suffer from that as well. It's a two-way trade because if you've got a relatively small company that's manufacturing and import and exporting from China and beyond, uh, it's not automatically the case, of course, that they're going to benefit from this. So I think that was one of the things that was, you know, potentially a little bit surprising. Um, and also some of the things were quite speculative as well, like, for example, the moves in crypto and so on. Let's move and look at things in the UK, uh, where we're seeing millionaires that are leaving the United Kingdom. What are some of the reasons for that? Yeah, it's quite interesting because looking at the stats now and just from our own experience dealing with clients around the world, the UK and Canada in particular, we've seen a lot of wealthy people leave these two countries recently. Now, there's many reasons for that. Uh, but I think one of the biggest reasons isn't just tax. It's really the sense that taxes are rising and the services aren't getting better because of the aging population. And there's a general malaise in terms of low growth, high regulation, high taxes, and there isn't light at the end of the tunnel. And I think a lot of people are motivated beyond tax to move to places maybe that are a little bit less regulated, have a bit more personal freedom. And I think we saw something similar in Canada as far in 2022, uh, after the truckers and, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think it goes beyond that. Uh, but I think also it is becoming a much bigger thing now because I heard a new expression. I mean, we've all heard of Brexit, right? Uh, but I heard of a, a Wexit, which is basically wealthy people leaving the UK. And it's become such a big thing now. So I think 28,000 millionaires have left in the last five years. So that's a huge amount when you consider that the UK has a population about five and a half times smaller than the United States. I'm curious, when they do leave, are there you know, uh, areas or regions that they are relocating to or that they're finding attractive? 
if you look at the biggest areas, places like Dubai or indeed even now Florida, but also places in Europe like Portugal, those places are the most popular, I think, right now with most British people. It does depend on their status. If they're a retiree, they're more likely to go to Europe. If they're a business person or entrepreneur, they're more likely to go to a place like Dubai. Uh, but essentially, most of them are going to those lower tax jurisdictions that are also on the move up. So the likes of Dubai, we have to remember that just like Mexico and just like some of these other countries, we spoke about the US and China uh, earlier. We have to remember one of the big trends in the world now, as the billionaire Ray Dalio has said, is that as China and the US, uh, their competition essentially heats up, those third countries like India, the UAE, maybe Mexico, who are quite open to money from all around the world are actually benefiting from this situation. So after the Ukraine-Russia war, for example, uh, Dubai got in not only British people, but Russians, Ukrainians, Chinese people from all around the world. So what we're seeing right now is a lot of those third jurisdictions like the UAE or, or for that matter, Singapore, where they're relatively neutral in terms of their political outlook as governments, they are actually benefiting quite a lot from the rise in geopolitical tensions. Given everything we've discussed over the past few minutes or so, how are you then advising uh, your clients in terms of how to invest, given everything that's happened over the past week? Well, I think one trade that people have to be careful about is government bonds. So the TLT ETF, which is like the long-term government bond ETF, it's been getting in record inflows. And there is a logic associated to that because as interest rates come down, usually, usually US treasuries do very well. However, in this situation where you've got a situation where the UK government is spending more money, the US government is going to spend more money, global protectionism is going up, there is actually a risk that unexpectedly next year, interest rates could actually go up rather than come down. Now, everyone seems to think interest rates are going to go down. And I do think on the balance of probability, that's still the case. But the risk of an inflation spike in the next year or two is now much higher. So that means people have to be a bit more worried about US treasuries. When it comes to emerging markets, they look very cheap, but they're cheap for a reason right now. And what's happening between the US, China and these other things, tariffs and so on, could really affect emerging markets. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have an allocation to it, maybe 10%. 20% is fine, but risks have definitely gone up for those emerging markets because they are highly dependent on global trade. Adam, thank you so much for your time. That's how we wrap up uh, this episode of Focus On with myself, Nastasia Aronsa. Thank you to my guest, Adam Fired, who is the founder of Adam Fired Brokers. From me, it's a goodbye.